we're going to talk about crop production strategies for next year and then actually go out in the field and look at some cropping systems and talk with veteran farmers and consultants who have done a lot of work to enhance soil health and water quality and we'll have a lot of discussion on cover crops. So that's really what the program is the next day and a half. We have two really outstanding individuals with us. Ken Hamilton, who's a nutritionist and microbiologist out of Logan, Utah, with Biomineral Technologies, who I think you I know you really enjoy talking in the animal area, the manure area, and the crop area. And Ken has a wealth of knowledge and experience and practicality in what he's going to bring to us. We work with Ken on a number of different fronts and and share knowledge and technology in an educational marketing format. Dr. Richard Mayfield will be here later today and he's going to talk about the role of microbes in the human gut and how they're tied to every part of our system as far as health. Really interesting individual. So as we go through the program this morning, I'll have a little introduction, and then Ken will come up and talk about animal health and manure management, and David's going to talk a little bit about one of our star products, Microbial Manure Master, as far as managing manure properly. And as you know, we have our Akushi cattle showing here, which is a breed of animal out of Japan that one of our guests uh, here today, Jim Nicholson, from Bill in South Dakota, as I heard of, and he talked me into getting uh, some of these animals last fall. So we're actually working with Jim uh, with the Akabushi breed, which is a breed of animal that brings better quality into the beef industry and tends to grade out very high on the prime side. And, uh, and so we're excited about that aspect. One of the things that I, would, that I would like to do is we have with us today uh, David Whitman, who's our, one of our consultants that's up on the Red River Falls area. We have Doug Riley, who is a, a professional manure applicator and grower that we've had a long working history with. That's with us today. And uh, we have Dennis Plockengate, who's our sales rep up in the, in the kind of the central, west central Minnesota area. We have uh, John with us is doing our videoing, and as I mentioned, this will be available at any time after the conference. If you'd like to get a segment or part that you like, or the whole segment, they will be available. And uh, we also have with us today um, Karen Seibert, who is working in uh, outreach marketing with us and bringing a lot of our information out to the grower. I mentioned Jim Nicholson, who's a uh, one of our growers we work with up in Bevelin, South Dakota, is with us. Uh, who, him and his son Lee, farm uh, corn soybeans and forages, and have an extensive, extensive beef operation, especially specializing in Akushi cattle. Um, our whole premise of what we want to talk about and what drives our company is really the word balance. And, and balance is positive. And all of us that are in agriculture know when we have a cylinder on a combine or a tire on a vehicle out of balance, it's kind of uncomfortable, isn't it? And so really the whole natural process is geared to be in balance. And the thing that drives that are the microbes. And then we know that nutrition is a, is a key to all this too, balanced nutrition. And this is really what we want to dive into the next day and a half and talk about. Because the key is, how can we in agriculture, as we go through the motion, get more out of every acre, every animal, and every gallon of manure? And there's ways we can do that. Uh, we're, we're faced with crop prices that are, you know, not as good as what they were or have been. So we're going to have to find out way, uh, ways that we can lower cost of production and, and improve the output or the quality factor to maintain or gain profitability. 
What we'll do with that is if you understand the roles of microbes and mineral nutrition, whether we're talking about animals or crops, is really key. So achieving more from every animal and every acre, we have what we call a full circle system, which allows us to cradle programs to do that. So this is an example of somebody who might have, for example, a livestock operation where we're looking at balancing throughout the whole system. We're looking at probiotic feed additives. We're looking at water revitalization. We're looking at manure management technologies. We're looking at soil health. We're looking at crop health, and we're looking at better feed quality coming back into the animal or be sold into the market for human or animal consumption. And we're talking about preservatives that will allow us to maintain quality of what we're harvesting. So every aspect of that whole circle is touched by microbes. And the driving force is nutrition. Even when we talk about manure digestion, all microbes, just like plants, work harder if they have the right nutrition to work with. So many of our products, when we look at microbial products, have microbial nutrients in them. So we're talking about products that either we use to inoculate in the soil, or a seed, or manure, or a forage, or we're talking about products that stimulate the native population to do what we want them to do for us. So when we look at the livestock side that we're going to talk about this morning, it's holistic. And it's unbelievable when you look at one aspect of properly managed manure and how it touches the whole operation. If we have manure that is putrefied and not broken down properly and we put it out in the field, it's going to create, create a lot of chaos. It's going to create a lot of imbalance in the soil, and the microbes in the soil then have to deal with that before they can do what we really want them to do, which is grow a healthy, nutritionally dense crop. And it has to do with how we extract the manure and the capacity of our lagoons and pits, the odor, the flies, the environmental aspects in a building, how long our facilities uh, last and our equipment from corrosion. But the real focal point of why we have animal manure is to put it in the field. And so by pre-digesting this manure ahead of time, when we put it out in the field, it's in a more balanced state, it's loaded with microbes, the nutrients are basically in a form that won't leach but are available, and that's what we want. And so over time, by doing this, what we do is we improve the soil ecology and as we improve the soil ecology, all of a sudden we see wheat pressures go down, insect pressures go down, disease pressures go down. We're now buying less synthetic materials to try to keep, treat symptoms and keep the crop healthy. So it's a holistic approach to production agriculture. And the tools that we tend to focus in on the livestock side are producing quality feed, Quality feed to me is, is feed that is, is high in mineral nutrition, is balanced, and feed that is healthy and doesn't have mold or apatoxin in it, or any of the detrimental effects that affects anything that, that will eat it. And of course, we use probiotic feed additives, both dry and liquids, to improve the health of the gut, of the animal. So, that has a lot of ramifications, and in the manure coming out will be enzyme active, will start to digest properly, and water quality is very, very important because water is a medium that carries nutrition to cells and toxins away, and there's a lot that goes into water quality. So we have product technologies that will help with water revitalization, and then the manure by augmentation and composting is an area that constantly is expanding. Now, around the country, we see a lot of beef confinement buildings going up. 
And obviously, as we put beef animals into these confinement buildings, these pits are 10 to 12 feet deep. And we have a lot of what we call lignin and cellulose type materials going into the pit. And if these pits are not treated properly, either through the animal with a probiotic or directly into the pit, then very shortly what we find is we lose pit capacity and the ability to extract this manure efficiently. So we spend a lot of money advocating adding water to liquefy it when microbes can do this. And so these are the areas that we're working in and it, it is, it's far reaching as I said from liquefaction and extraction and uniform application and spreading and the ability to work around something that isn't odorous and nasty and sludgy especially as we haul with semis this manure to outlying locations but agronomically we see a 5 to 15 percent increase in yield within one to two years of doing this. So what is the value of that? What is the value of reduced meat competition? What is the value of reduced tillage cost? Because if you improve the health of the soil, it doesn't take the horsepower to pull the implement through the field as an example. So the bottom line is this, producers who understand the value of biology and manure can reduce plant nutrient costs, improve soil and plant health, improve crop residue decomposition, we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow morning, detoxify the soil and improve nitrogen utilization and other plant nutrients efficiently and improve the feed quality coming out of that field. Here's an example of one of our producers five, six, seven, eight years ago that used bio-augmented manure and put it in a zone and then plant over the top of it. Look at the amount of root mass that is there and root health. And the value of this bio-augmented manure is just not the retention of nutrient, reduced odor, but it's the microbes and the microbial communities that are in there that when put in the soil continue to propagate and to work. That is where the value comes from. Now, this is a event that David Whitman and I attended a, a week or so ago down in Springfield, Missouri. It was a National Manure Expo. And they took us out to a dairy farm. And we spent, believe it or not, uh, an hour getting out there, an hour back. And we spent two hours at this lagoon with, with what we call about six to eight of these manure stirring boats that cost anywhere from $150,000 to over $200,000. And each one of them demonstrated how well they could mix that lagoon up. Well, really what they were doing is mixing up putrefied manure that if put out in the field will cause a lot of damage. Because number one, it's high in salts. It's got a lot of aldehydes and formaldehydes in it. Uh, it's got pathogens in it, and when that's put in the field, it's going to create a lot of problems. And all I want to do is 10 minutes at the mic and said, this is unnecessary. If you would take, take and properly treat this manure over an 8 to 12 year uh, month period of time, you would bring all the solids all off the bottom, you would completely digest it, you would drive down the salts, and you no longer would have putrefied manure that could go in the field to do what I think you wanted to do. And so next year we're hoping that the event is going to be in Pennsylvania that we can get ahead of the curve and work with the producer that is holding the event and actually work with their pits and liquid manures uh, to take care of it. So with that, uh, if somebody wants to get to Ken Hamilton, uh, we're going to bring Ken out, but while we're waiting for Ken, I do want to mention a couple of things. Every one of you that came and got a handout with the agenda for the next day and a half in here. We also have a bio of Ken and Dr. Richard Mayfield and some information on what he's going to present. We have kind of a little bit of a write-up on it's all about balance, and in here, we list all of, uh, all of the either all the technologies that can be used in animal manure and crop production that you can tap into to do that 
We also provide some information on our crop, early order crop program, as far as discount program, uh, for those that are interested. And we also have some information and incentives to reward those that attend the conference, uh, like some additional discount opportunities. Also in here, and we'll hear uh, David talk about this later, Proper Pro does provide a, a complete financial program for growers. Either unsecured up to 250000 or secured, there's really no limit, it depends on the grower. Uh, David Whitman and our company runs that program. He has 30 years in banking. And so if you're interested in this, please see David, and he'll tell us a little bit more about that later in the program. Also, we have a complete bio of the key products that we provide. And what I did is I put a little bit of a heart here on here in beneficial microbial enhancement technology. And these are products that either are inoculants or stimulants. And so if you look through here, most every product that we handle is included in that category. We provide these products to what we might consider to be conventional or biological farmers as well as to the organic community. Also, uh, a really interesting article, our microbes, our microbes are under threat, meaning our microbes and the enemy is us. A really good article, and this is kind of what Dr. Richard Mainfield will be covering uh, later on today. There's also some very interesting articles here on mycorrhizae fungi and the importance of them in crop production and free living bacteria will lift soil nitrogen. So, the thing we have to understand as producers is microbes are here to retain and to cycle our nutrients, and there's somewhere around 34,000 tons of nitrogen above every acre. And if we have the right microbes in the soil and the right microbes on the plant leaf, we can harvest that and take advantage of it. And that's what Ken Hamilton is going to talk to us about. So. Let's welcome Ken Hamilton, and Ken is going to take us through the animal side and the nurse side uh, as we go through the morning. So, Ken? Yeah. I wanted to take just a minute and ask you producers if you could choose four things that you wish you had that would make your agricultural production easier, what would they be? No debt. Ah, okay. No debt. More time. More time. Alright, well, we got two of them so far. Yeah. Time. Higher production. Production. Alright. What other problems are out there that you'd like to get rid of? Stress of money in the operation. Ah, now there's an interesting point. Stress of running the operation. Jim, how do we get that stress? Sometimes we bring it on ourselves, <laughs> but it, yeah, it, it's dealing with the things that come up every day that we've got to drop what we're doing a lot of times to handle, and a lot of it is because we probably haven't been planning. Okay. Well, who would like an employee that comes pre-programmed, he knows his job perfectly well, and there's no training involved? Sounds like a pretty good employee. Sounds like a pretty good employee. And they tend to work about 24 hours a day. And they don't ask for much. Do they ask for the weekend off? No. No. No, no weekends off. No overtime pay? No overtime pay. 
Where do we hire from there, right? Okay. Well, we're going to talk about how many of you guys have weed issues? Okay. Are weeds a problem for anybody? What about diseases? Do they bother anybody? Probably only for a lot, right? Okay. So, these are some of the problems that inflict us as we go about our conventional agricultural systems. Right? I like Jim's comment about stress. Right? Jim, how easy is it to find great employees? It's very difficult. Jim, how hard is it to train a great manager? Takes a long time. Takes a long time. Right? Employees are the biggest problem. Employees are always the biggest problem. Okay. Well, they, to tell you that. they are. Well, all right. So, can we put another workforce in place that is already pre programmed, knows exactly what to do and how to do it? Do we have a workforce that we can engage? help us solve some of these problems? The answer is absolutely yes. Our microbes. That's the great part about this unseen workforce that we potentially have at our disposal. Now, historically, for the last five or six decades in agriculture, we've been taught to largely ignore this resource. Because companies that had a financial stake at selling refined fertilizer, so we can make this job a lot easier for you farmers to understand. We can bring about simplified NPK, and you don't have to worry about anything else. You just put this out, and automatically happens. Life gets easy, and it's wonderful. So we've been going down that road for a long time. So how many things have gotten wonderfully better because of that approach? We did simplify fertility. I don't think we improved it by any means. But look at the host of issues that we have come up with. We use far more pesticides than we have ever used, yet we have higher crop losses than we've ever had. We use far more herbicides than we've ever used, and yet we have far more weed pressures. And now, resistant weeds to herbicides. We're using far more antibiotics than we've ever used, and we have higher levels of diseases in every sector of livestock in the human community. There's not one section of any living system that is improved under the conventional chemical toxic rescue theology. Nothing's gotten better. We have gotten bigger at doing worse. Because what we did is we chose to go a different route than following that natural process which nature put here in place. And the antibiotics, the herbicides, the pesticides, the fungicides are all very detrimental on this largely trained wonderfully organized workforce that could potentially be there. So in the process of getting modern and getting big, we decimated probably our largest natural resource to help us do things right. And the thing that I like about them is the divine creator who put these little guys together, they already came pre-programmed. They already know what to do. It's not like we have to go through a training course, but we give these guys a job. We just put them in the environment and try our best not to kill them. And they know what to do. That's the coolest part about microbes, is they come pre-programmed by the greatest architect in the universe. And they're here to help us. And then we turn around and we walk, walk the other way. So I'm suggesting that 
Maybe we take a really hard look at employing this workforce because fundamentally, this is what the transformation has to be to move us back into fewer problems. Right? We can make more money, higher production at lower cost. I think I can pay down some debt. Right, Jim? Yep. That's a little point. If I have employed this huge workforce to go out and decompose my residue so I don't have to go out and spray nitrogen, I can go fishing. That's a lot more fun in your life. Now we're talking. If I'm not chasing an endless list of problems, I have more time to take my wife on a date. Right. Or buy her a, a, another snowmobile that I really like. <laughs> or an ATV. So what happens is these microbes help us manage. And they're a huge resource if we know how to use them. They can produce a lot of extra time for us. They can take a lot of stress out because we don't have to go find them in the morning. They don't have to clock in. They don't clock out. They just do a great job. We just have to know who these little guys are and what job they do really well. And so if we put them in the right place, really cool things start to happen. And that's the fun about biology. And so. Where's our response? And in a lot of respects, Ken, they're basically free if you just initially employ them. Oxygen, and lo and behold, 
We get sugars. Out of fear. We get simple sugars, and nature takes the simple sugars. A couple of monosaccharides will give us a disaccharide. We combine these and we move up to oleosaccharides, and then we get into polysaccharides. So plants do this wonderful, amazing job of using resources from the soil, microbial interaction, sunlight energy, gases that we get a plant. Now, that's great step one. But the problem is, is a plant isn't the cell available to an animal or a human or anything else. So now we have to go through the process of tearing apart, which we just put together. It's digestion. So how am I going to increase the effectiveness of my digestion? Okay, so now I've got the stomach. And I want to talk about this concept here because we don't very often think about how this wonderful stomach or this intestinal tract that absorbs works. All right, so let's just look at this as a whole system. All right? Does it matter what I put in there? Yes. Yes. Okay, why? What goes in is will create either a healthy or unhealthy. Why? 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 Does it matter? Good stuff in, good stuff out. Bad stuff in, bad stuff out. What's bad? What's good? The more nutrient dense uh, crops we provide, the better or better quality feed. It's going to give you a better quality animal product in the end. If crop nutrition is not there, then you're not going to be able to get quite as good. Let's roll the nanotoxins. Okay, we have, we have feed quality is an issue. Okay, we have toxins are an issue. Antibiotics. Oh, oh. What about our antibiotic use? How much more antibiotic use in livestock do we have in the human sector? Well, yeah, more human animals. sector. It's just another time. Well, we use them as growth promoters. Whether the animals are sick or not, they're going to get a dose of antibiotics. Okay, so all of this material begins to have some kind of a positive or negative effect on my digestive system. Am I correct? It does. So what I'm doing is either I'm creating the good guys or I am creating the bad guys. So this is the wonderful thing about nature. This is we're all completely tied together in individual operations that affect the whole. There's no such thing as, as oh, I'm only going to hurt myself. Or the kidney says, don't worry about it, Mr. Liver. I'll work on this stuff over here and I won't have any effect on you. It's not the case. We all are interconnected. And so if we pollute one part of the system, it becomes part of the whole. There's nothing that you can put in that doesn't affect the whole situation. So if I acidify my rumen way too much, what part of the animal is not affected? It's all connected. It'll eventually all get there. So every input I have is going to play a role in animal health. And it also changes my microbiome inside that intestinal tract. So if I load my stuff up with a whole series of antibiotics and toxins, what I'm doing is, is I'm encouraging this sector to now become the dominant group. It's not an accident. Okay? Unknowingly, we control the microbial communities in our soil, on our skin, in our digestive tracts, in our nervous systems. We think, why do you do anything to those guys? Well, what happens when I'm 
put out a fungicide or a pesticide, or I administered antibiotics. Okay? Everything that we put into something or onto something has an effect. If we begin to realize what we're doing to alter this microbial community, we probably will think twice about what we do. Because it's never, I just give it a shot, and I don't have to worry about it anymore. Because what I did with the initiation of that input, I just started a very predictable dominant chain of events. We were talking a little bit yesterday about we have the agency to choose how we manage. We do. We can decide what inputs we put in. We can decide how we manage our resources. What we do not have the luxury of is choosing the consequences. Okay? So, and the thing is about microbes, they're extremely predictable. They're incredibly reliable. They are truthfully honest. So, I go over here, and let's say I administer some of these known toxins, and it really takes my good guys down and my bad guys up. All right? The difference in production of what happens here is the bad guys in any system, whether it's a soil or a, an intestinal tract, they alter the pH. Now, that's not a good thing, because they're going to take the pH the wrong way. As I alter the pH, it's going to encourage more and more bad gas. It's going to take it's going to drop my digestion. Now, this is the cool thing about all these microbes. In the manure, when we get the wrong microbes, they putrefy. They take my nitrogen and they set it up as ammonia. And my phosphate goes up as phosphate gas. Uh oh, I could have used that later. All right? My sulfur goes up as hydrogen sulfide, so off go my minerals. Well, the same thing happens in a gut. My food sources are improperly converted. And now, I don't have digestible nutrients in the right compound. Because remember, this gorgeous corn plant that I just grew, or this wonderful hay plant, no longer is, was ever in the right form for digestion in the first place. I got too much plant stuff. Cells don't like plants. They like the little tiny parts of plants. Well, the biology is supposed to take that cool stuff that we just grew and put it into a really cool chunk of dinner for my cell down there that's got a big old smile and a hat and a big hungry tongue. Right? My biology converts my food. The wrong biology does not convert your food into digestible nutrients. And it's going to give you a whole bunch of toxic compounds. Back. Now, what is my good biology? Uh oh. They're going to improve my digestion. Okay? We're going to talk about that coming right here. They're going to give me a whole bunch of cool enzymes that I didn't have. These guys are going to give me a whole bunch of wonderful good old poisons. What they produce. Okay? These guys are going to give me vitamins. These guys are going to give me hormones. They're going to give me growth regulators. Okay? All of this stuff, I really would like to have in my system because these are all very health promoting. This is all very disease and symptom oriented. Okay? So under our conventional system, we don't really produce quality food. We don't produce quality plants because we use too few minerals. We have to try to keep it alive the best we can. We're fighting off a deed, 
we're fighting off a bacteria pathogen, we're fighting off a fungal pathogen, then Lord have mercy. What happens when the big B-52 bomber insects come in? And they're coming in to take stuff out and take away. So we're having with pesticides. So the systems have this wonderful way of communicating. A friend of mine used to say, what you do rings so loudly in my ears I can't hear what you're saying. Plants tell us a myriad of things. Soils tell us a myriad of things. Insects, diseases are all telling us a whole bunch of fascinating things. We want to put on the blinders and say, I am so busy and so stressed out, I don't have time for this nonsense. And we do that. We go, cotton picking weeds will just kill it. Okay, we'll whack it with another shot of what Okay, we're going to come in and we'll show you. So we've got very, very good at managing symptoms and not ever dealing with the underlying causes. So when a plant has a symptom, it's not growing right. Picks up a disease. When we get sick, the system is telling us that something's wrong. What we should be seeing is all of these flags and signals that we're given out there. And at the base of every problem, if you really want to get to the base of the problem, not just buy something chemically or synthetically to go after and treat the problem temporarily and then face it again next month or next year, you really want to get to the root of the problems, you better look at two factors. Biology and nutrition. And biology's job is to create nutrition. Simple as that. Okay? There's not an organism on the planet that doesn't rely upon nutrition. I of course have to have nutrition. Okay? So let's look at how we manage this force. Is everything that we put into every system that we do, whether it's a lagoon, whether it's a feed, whether it's a soil plant, is going to have a predictable effect. So let's fundamentally go back and look at how we manage the biology on this side. And okay, we've talked a lot in the past year about minerals. What role do minerals play in this? But we have to remember that the presence of minerals does not ensure plant nutrition. I can have all the minerals in my soil, and unless something adequately converts that mineral into a really great compound that I can use, very little I can utilize. It's the biology that does this. I can eat the greatest meal, and if I have an imbalanced microbial community in my gut, I'm still sick. And I contend that we do not have any healthy humans. We have half sick humans that exhibit no symptoms. And we have sick humans who need to exhibit some or lots of symptoms. Because we don't manage our microbes well at all. I'm going to take on Doug here just a little tiny bit. <laughs> I am not too Doug. Here it is. Okay. Doug loves Mountain Dew. Okay. Well, Doug, have you ever tested the pH of Mountain Dew? Okay. What do sugars do in your system? What's carbonation in your system? <laughs> what does caffeine do in your system? Carbonic acid is very acidic. There you go. That's one big component of the whole working against us. But the problem is, is, is your biology responds to your inputs. You good guys don't like that when you do that. The pathogen too. But sorry. The, the cool part here is, I get to be brutally honest and blunt about this. I am weaning down. I'm down to about one, one bottle a day. Great, Dad. Last 
Why was she proud of it? Maximize its nutrient <coughs> value. Oh, there's still a mineral in it? Yeah. There's something good in there? Yeah. Doug, you're a manure guy. Do you love manure? I do. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, is it still has nutrition in it. So, obviously, that wonderful filter in the center we call an animal didn't get all that much of it. Some animals are a little bit better at getting this stuff than other animals. However, we can change the rate of conversion with our biology. All right? So this is what we want to look at, is what part of our components become digestible? All right? Our simple sugars are highly digestible. Our starches, our pectins, our hemicellulose and cellulose, as we go up the chain, we start to lose our digestibility. Now, I've got to employ this wonderful workforce to do a better job at taking these structures back into these structures. Because really, all these guys are, are lots of these guys. That's simply, you've got to undo the natural process of Photosynthesis and cell formation. I've got to take it apart. The better I take it apart, the more steak I produce and the less manure I have. Now that doesn't fit so well for Doug, but <laughs> to everyone else, he's still got money. We want to convert this material. And so this becomes how efficiently do we do this? Now what do we see here on the content of an animal stomach here? What's visually different? Color. 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 Size. Okay. What color is this fat? White. What color is this fat? Yellow. 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 Okay. All right. What we have here is a corn plant or a corn fed animal that has fed <coughs> GMO material. All right? The input effect on this animal here has had a high level of toxins go into the digestive system. We've completely altered the biology. And what I have, now have is a load of toxins that the kidneys and the liver try to push as far away from viral organs as they possibly can. The color of your fat, the content of your fat, will tell you the type of toxicity and the level of problems that the animal has. Yellow means that you have a high level of toxins that are being moved away from the white organs. White, way less toxicity. Okay? You're now seeing animals that go into the slaughterhouse that their livers are literally all that decomposed in them. They pull them out and they splatter out of them. Okay? It's not normal. You have kidney failure. What we've gotten very, very good at doing is keeping animals alive just long enough to kill them. And we have degraded animals, we have very unhealthy animals, because not that we did not that we just we fed them corn, or that we fed them silage, or we fed them alfalfa, is because we administered a high level of toxins supported by antibiotics to keep them alive that altered the gut, which created a whole series of toxins, pathogens, poisons, and indigestible nutrients that degraded this animal to here. But this one didn't have that type of battle to fight. Okay? This is the same thing in hogs. You see a non GMO fed stomach, and you see this stomach. So, in animal health, the inputs are having a direct effect on life, production, and profitability. Why, why do we see this effect, uh, Ken? What is creating this irritation? Okay. 
what happens is when we have an input of a toxin, a non-toxin, and our GMOs are all largely supported by glyphosate and glucosinate, which are very toxic compounds. They do two things, chelate minerals, and they stimulate pathogens like crazy. So when we produce GMO crops, something is intended to eat these. Maybe not our animals, but somebody's animals. Right? When they eat them, the glyphosate acts as an antibiotic in the rumen. Glyphosate is a patented antibiotic, and it is a nasty one. Now, when you talk about microbial resistance to glyphosate, it takes one tenth of one part per million to start taking out your beneficial microorganisms. It takes 4,000 times more to take your pathogens out. And, as we'll see, when we have glyphosate present in the system, or these other toxins, our good guys' populations drop through the floor, and our pathogens shoot through the floor. So now, all of a sudden, we come right back to this model. Who's in charge of digestion, and what are the byproducts of digestion? Is it any one of your animals or sick? It is 100% predictability. It is a 100% safe bet. And so, the laboratory balance in the U.S., we look at the human population. Gee, I wonder if there's any correlation there. Botulism in cattle, Clostridium, Botulinum. Really, really nasty organism. It's always present where glyphosate and the GMOs are being used. Here we go, without glyphosate. Natural cautious, the cows. Look at the high presence of beneficial microorganisms, 10 to the 9. That is in a billion of biology there. Now, with glyphosate, look where my big guys are. Look where my clustering watch will line up. And neurotoxins are. We just traded places. Okay, a guaranteed 100% safe bet switch biology. <laughs> this is the difference in the gut appearance. That's a little brutal, but that's exactly what they look like. Because what happens is, is you introduce the toxins. See, this is what we don't often consider in our biological world. When we switch the microbial communities, we don't get to choose what they produce. And so when they produce the toxins, our stomach and intestinal linings no longer have the protective mechanisms of the good guys because we've taken them out. And so our cells begin to disrupt and come apart because we cannot withstand the toxic of the biology. If you want to call it biochemical or whatever, it's poop. Microbes produce very toxic poop in the pathogens. And our cells don't handle this well. So what we see... Jim, that also carries over into the nerve, too, when it goes into the lunar pit, and then we wonder why we're having trouble to get it properly digested. It, it, it affects that also, right? It continues. Glyphosate has a very long healthy, unhappy, miserable life. It doesn't just end because we digest it through an animal. It goes into the manure. What we've also done now is we have skyrocketed our E. coli, skyrocketed our mysteria, our salmonella, and these viral pathogens, who are now antibiotic resistant, by the way. So we've got a whole bunch of these nasty guys out in our <coughs> manure. Then we transfer that out into our soil, decoil. Oh, God, this place too. You know, I'll just keep doing what I do. I'll get on the plants, I'll go for another ride. I end up in somebody's digestive tract, I make them sick, I go back to poop, I go back into the field. Wow, this is a great ride. This is a great ride. 
and all round and round and round we go. The pathogens in the system really take things down. And so what we have is these pathogens really are everywhere. And what we need to do is learn how to control the use of pathogens. And it isn't going to ever be accomplished effectively with antibiotics. That is a band-aid on the Titanic. That boat's going down. Right? How we control microbial populations is with numbers. If I want to reduce the bad guys, I go with the good guys. Because the good guys are already pre-programmed to go with the bad guys in their place. Now, God will never let you kill all the bad guys. You say, wow, you know, if they just weren't here, they wouldn't mess with us. Well, if they weren't here, we wouldn't have a bad system. We wouldn't be here. So pathogens play a role. They are there to clean up the gene pool. They do. They're going to take out sick, unhealthy, infected plants. Right? So we need to learn how to deal with all of these pathogenic organisms by not creating them in the first place. <coughs> Okay? There are toxicity. Glyphosate's well, big in our agricultural world. Okay? You can see the half a part of the area that we disrupt the endocrine system of humans. Or in India, our reproduction in our livestock, our hogs, our poultry, our cattle. All well, it takes a half a part of the area. We come in here, disrupts our enzyme system, our what? Liver damage. Our cell damage, our mitochondria, our nucleotide, coming here DNA damage here. Our unborn children, birth defects. Right? Come on down here, the symptoms get worse. And our USDA, the EPA says, well, if this isn't bad enough, guys, we'll just keep raising the level of glyphosate acceptability in your food supply. Now we're up to 30 and 40 and 50 parts per million. And cattle don't worry about it, guys. You can go to 400 parts per million and now half. There's not one organism on this planet that's going to live long enough to have grandchildren of 400 parts per million. That's a tremendous amount of toxicity. Okay? 440% Increase in birth defects. Okay? Brazil, almost identical in some of their research. Okay? Heart, muscular, thyroid, increasing miscarriages, cancer, children. And it isn't just humans, it's our livestock. Okay? These effects, they're all parallel. You want to wipe out soil biology? Use glyphosate. You want to wipe out digestive biology? Feed to your home products. You want to wipe out your metabolic producing organisms in your gut that are going to keep you healthy? Eat to your food. It's predictable as sun up to sun down as we got there. If you have GMO crops and don't spray the glyphosate, does it still have, it still has a negative effect, but is it still? No, no, it's a big factor. You have two factors in your GMO crops you have the gene alteration. So what they get is they put in a gene that allows the plant to tolerate glyphosate. Okay. And so what the gene does is it alters, it kind of rewires the programming of the plant. So what it does is it now produces allergens. Okay. It'll take the form of proteins differently. Okay. So what we did is we took it and we inserted a gene out of the micro into a different organism or plant. Well, they don't have the same software. So what we've done now is when we is when we alter and put one gene in, we alter thousands and thousands of biochemical changes. So we get allergies. That's that's foreign to our system yeah. or animals. Our, our plants now put things together a little bit differently. When we eat it, our body goes, hey, what's that? Well, that's not what we eat. So it reacts against us. So we have allergenic reactions. And so some of them are severe enough to kill us. And some of them are just perpetual irritation, like Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome. 
we our stomach's always irritated because we're having some type of our body says we don't want that. A lot of your autoimmune diseases, especially when you're body fighting yourself, says that shouldn't be here. That's not right. You offered something. Let's get rid of that of the body. And so we have the gene alteration, but we don't have the toxicity. We don't have the glyphosate molecule that kills the good guys, stimulates the bad guy, and kills cells. Okay? So we have probably the smaller part of the equation bad. We don't have a big part of the equation that's really, really detrimental. And so, so but our plants are altered in what they construct. So, and, and even the shelf life of a glyphosate application, what is what is its half life? Twenty years. Twenty years. Yeah. And 20 so years. I quit using it flat out. My brothers don't try to use it anymore either. Um, and I I don't even use the GMO seed. I went back to conventional. Well, the good part, the good part about all this is, yeah. is you have microbes. They're really their job is to take this stuff apart. We have biology that can dismantle glyphosate. The, the problem, the reason that why glyphosate has the potential to last so long in our soils is because we've wiped out the guys who go in and do the dismantling jobs. And so it sits there in detoxifies, but it doesn't be great. I mean, it detoxifies, it means it just gets stuck into a hole, and it latches on to something in the soil profile, and it sits over there. And without a biology, microorganisms can come apart and say, you know, this is really a nasty compound. Let me just go here and fix a few things so that you're not quite so toxic. It's going to stay the way it is. Microbes are the only thing that are going to biologically, through metabolism, alter that toxic compound and put it back into a simpler form that says, oh, you know what? The phosphate is now no longer toxic. The carbons are no longer toxic. The nitrogen is no longer part of the equation. You can take the oxygen, hydrogen, all of the components now come apart, and they become elemental, and we can start to use them to build something different. Okay? That's the job of biology. Okay, so probiotics. What are probiotics? Things that make us healthy. Okay? And who produces these little critters? Bugs. Bugs, bugs, bugs. Trillions and trillions and trillions of bugs. Okay? We got lots of cells and we got lots more bugs. So if you think this is a, is a conspiracy, they outnumber us. It's a good thing they can't vote. Because <laughs> we would all be executed. <laughs> we are not very good stewards of these guys, okay? But the nice thing is, is they do some wonderful, wonderful things. Digestion, ah, break down the food. So all this cool stuff that the plant put together that the animal can't get, these guys are really good at putting it into a different form of digestion. Okay, nobody likes constipation or diarrhea. We've got to have these guys take and make these bioavailable nutrients. Now, what we often think is, is the microbes, and I asked this question yesterday, are you getting fed? Is your nutrition coming from your food? Or is it coming through your biology? biology. Now that's weird. That's weird thought. Right? Who's feeding you really? How much nutrients in our food? Not what there used to be. Right? So how is it that we still keep living as well as we live? Is, is the only nutrient we take in in our food? Or do we have this really cool little community that we don't see that's already trained, shows up by the day, and says, hey, you know what? I'm ready to go. Anytime you are. And when you go to sleep, I'm still working. Right? I go round the clock, on and on. When I die, guess what? I'm going to make a whole bunch of little guys just like me to take my place so I can catch you. Right? And I'm going to produce all of these really cool bioavailable nutrients in your cell. I'm going to produce vitamins that you can't produce. I'm going to produce vitamins that aren't in your food. I'm going to produce enzymes. 
simply because I'm going to eat things and produce things that you can't. And that's why it's so crucial that we employ this biology in our livestock, in our soils, in our systems if we want to stay healthy. Because we get far more from our food than just the nutrients. It's, there's a huge supplemental force of biology that's putting a whole bunch of really great compounds into our system that I will tell you is far more nutritious for us than any food that we eat. So my food determines whether I have good guys down there or I have bad guys down there. Right? Immune system. Bad guys are not going to do anything for this. Our good guys eat toxins and kill pathogens. Now that's cool, right? They're going to take those substances that do come in, and their job is to undo them. And they're going to keep these guys in check, prevent yeast and mold, and have a harmful bacteria. So this is an ongoing process. These guys are tiny. We don't even see them. 25,000 of these little guys in an inch. Did you guess that? We don't put those together. Okay? These guys are the size of a micron. There's a million of these guys in the So that's why we don't see them. They're so small. We don't even think about them. Our intestinal makeups. Got a lot of good guys. Should have 90, 85 to 90 percent higher of the good guys. And these guys actually got a, got a group in here. That takes up the biggest part of this that are really highly functional but not pathogenic. And we get into, we'll show you some other slides, but the breakdown is a little bit more precise than this one. Chlorinated water antibiotics, medical treatments, pharmaceuticals. These were very, very harsh on biologies that we're trying to take. And so it doesn't matter, a pharmaceutical to us is no different than a pesticide to the soil. That's a really harsh effect on the good guys through there. Our phototropic anaerobes don't use oxygen. And they take the poisons and toxins in the environment, that stuff which we can't use, and they give us that cool oxygen and amino acids. We get that antioxidants. Uh -huh. I like that. Okay? Microbes in the body. They drive off toxins and pollutions, they generate this health forming stuff, and get rid of the bad guys. They do this all at the same time. Multiply and balance the system. We always talk about balance. And even within the system, there's a balance of good guys. You can't have all one species in there. Same in the soil. If I have nothing but all wonderful bacteria, then it's going to have a functional soil community in my ground out there. Yes. If, if you have all... If I only have bacteria, oh, all beneficial bacteria, bacteria no. in my soil... You don't have protozoa, you don't have fungi. Yeah. Okay, I've got to have lots of other organisms right. because it's a community. It's like we talked yesterday. What if we had 50,000 people in town, they were all bankers, half of them were bankers and half of them were shoemakers? Who's going to fix your car? Who's going to make your bread? Isn't one of the major underlying principles of microbial health diversity? It's always diversity. That's the reason populations work so well, is I have 50,000 people, they all do different things. The more diversity that I have, and let's talk about diversity for just a second, because that is a perfect scenario. That we want to, that, that goes into this is why, why is diversity important? What I like diversity with my manure pits is I got guys that work on odor, crusting, flies, and then I got guys that work on the sludge and the setup. A lot of other products don't do that. Hey, diversity. Right? What factors affect the environment out there? What big factors? Rains? Moisture? Temperature? Okay. 
Well, we've got, let's say we've got moisture. Okay? Heat. Heat, hot and cold. All right. Temperature affects things out there. Toxins. Ah, toxins have an effect. pH of the system. The entire pH has a huge effect on what goes on out there. Inputs. What do I just put in the system? Environment. I have oxygen. Do I have oxygen? Plus or minus. I have all kinds of factors that are constantly changing. Nature's not static. So what happens if if all of my microbes are acting at one time, what if I only have a few and they're functional? So when my pH changes, are they still going to work? Nope. When my temperature changes, uh oh, not comfortable for microbes, I'm done. When my moisture changes, when I go from 0% moisture to 100% moisture, I need microbes that function at every moisture range, at every temperature range, at every pH range. I need microbes that, that dissolve every mineral in the soil. Okay? I got 80 some minerals. Well, one microbe is going to care all part of I got to have a whole diversity of microbes. I got to have microbes that take pathogens out. in all conditions. And I may need 10 or 15 microbes to stop one nasty pathogen from getting to my plant. So if I don't have this broad spectrum of diversity, what is happening to my community? Dysfunctional. Okay? And so this is why we have to have diversity and balance. Because we have all of these other factors in the system, we have pathogens. We have disease-causing organisms. Right? We have compaction. We have too much rain sometimes. We don't have enough rain. How do biology help us? We get the good guys out there. They loosen our soils. They give us popcorn balls instead of cat balls. We activate the soil structure. So I retain more oxygen. I have more water retention. I have better root penetration. Uh, far better disease suppression, right? They did that for me, and they're doing it all the time in all the different ways. I've got to have huge diversity in the gut. I've got guys that are constantly dealing with inputs. I've got things from acidity inputs to alkaline inputs. I can have a biology of every type and size dealing with those inputs constantly to maintain pH. And that's what probiotics, that's what beneficial anaerobes do. When the pH is too low because we fed too much silage and we started to move the acidosis, these guys go, okay, all right, time to produce some cool compounds, we're going to kick it in this, we're going to have the intestinal lining do this, we're going to put up a whole bunch of cool microbacillus microbes that produce acidic buffers, and boom, comes back at the pH. They adjust it just like this, and our animal says, oh, God, I don't have to be sick. If those guys are not there, the yeah, animal gets sick. Predictable as possible. So we don't want these pathogens roaming around having a free run at our food and our animal health. Okay? This is a very important part right here. This is intestinal integrity, the, the pillow of lining. This is really cool because this is the barrier between that outside world of pathogenic intake. And the, the stop of the proliferation and transfer of pathogens across this intestinal tract. This is the barrier that keeps the bad guys and stops these guys. And this barrier is largely governed by two things. The presence of good guys and the stimulation of good guys to create compounds that kill pathogens. Bad guys get taken out one or two ways. This intestinal lining produces
produces these concentrates, these biochemicals, these biocides. Takes out the bad guys. The good guys are stimulating the system. They're stimulating these cells to produce all kinds of great things to stop this pathogenic entrance. Okay? So the system's there. We just gotta load it up with the good guys. Right? Digestion and health, balance, pathogenic. We've got to get rid of these guys in, in poultry. Right? We have, as we go through these different things, you'll see that the role of these things are very, very similar in a lot of these functions in these animals. Poultry, food performance and digestion. You don't get more eggs, but what you do get is a whole lot better quality of eggs. Larger eggs, better shells. Okay? Better feed conversion. Right? Stimulation of the immune system. Let's go into your cattle. How about the diarrhea disorders? Biggest loss of our calves, intestinal disorders, diarrhea, right after being born or when they're converted to a weaning child. There's more calves, not much to advance, and it's through diarrhea. And all diarrhea is, is I've got the wrong biology in my gut, the food goes through too fast, doesn't digest, the animal stand, oh man. I got a whole bunch of bad guys in there, and I got to get rid of them. So I'm pulling all the moisture from the body, I'm flushing it through the digestive system, and before long, the animal can't absorb nutrients, it dehydrates itself, tips over, four feet go straight to heaven, no rodents are all. That's what you got in hogs, too, with PED. Thank you. Okay, forcing epidemic diarrhea virus. Okay, takes them out by the millions. For two days, they're all fine. Okay. Very, very simple. Inoculation of good microbes. This is the problem with baby animals, baby humans, is we don't come with a full set of functional biology. We don't have it in there. So in the environment, the pathogen gets in there first. He walks in there, there's him. There's buffets, there's warm climate. He's a happy, happy pet. Because he's going to go to town. He's going to eat. He's going to drink. And off he goes. However, if there's a whole group of people in front of the buffet counter, that is just not going to get anything to eat. And he's not going to deliver. And so the good guys are there as a barrier to convert the nutrients and stop the bad guys. So the fact that your baby hogs are dying simply tells you, I do not have an active, beneficial community of microbes in my gut. As simple as that. A pathogen got in there, got to the food source, proliferated, and the body's doing everything it can to get rid of it. Flush them out, one way to the other. You got crusty eyes, you got boogery nose, you got runny stuff, you got diarrhea. Your body says, something is in here that needs to get out. And I'm going to push it out and try and save your life. Well, in the process, if we don't stop that problem, if we don't stop that, we dehydrate and we lose our animals. This all comes back to we lack the proper biology. Because when we give those hogs a five, or five uh, milliliter shot right at birth, we don't lose baby pigs. No. We don't lose our calves. We don't lose our chickens. Because the pathogens aren't now controlling the intestinal tract. Not creating the problem. So the USDA says we're going to spend four million dollars to develop a vaccine for people. They will. Okay. And they'll spend a whole lot more. And by the time they develop the first vaccine, the organism would mutate. mutate just enough so that they'll do this until the vaccine disappears. Or, or until the organism finally runs its course and, and then they'll be out to the next fiasco. So on and on we go, if we use the right biology, we just go through the process of competitive exclusion and they don't have a place at the dinner table and they're not going to affect the system. So it's cattle. Feed conversion, let's go back here. Feed conversion, milk production, body weight. 
And I'll read to the cop in the morning, right, Jim? Okay. She, Ruben is the same. Okay. Preventing pathological conditions, correcting balances in biology, they provide energy, helps in rehydration after stress and disease. All of these symptoms cross over, over and over and over. What are the mechanics? What is the process of these, of these um, probiotics? What are they doing? Stop the invasion of pathogens. Colonize our digestive tract. Okay? Secretion of antimicrobial substances is biosynthesis. The bacteria sense. Here we go. Immunoglobulins. These are produced by our biology. <coughs> Intestinal, this is increases the uh, intestinal response to infections. These little guys are very, very crucial in maintaining the health of the system. You've got these proteolytic enzymes, and you've got this alteration and disintegration of our chemical carcinogens. So, this so is. Yeah, yeah. If you were to design, have the opportunity to design from scratch today, a guy says, comes to you and says, I want to raise, I want to have, I want to have a premier beef operation, let's say, and I want you to tell me how to do it right from A to Z so that I can have high quality premium cattle and avoid all of the negative aspects of being in that business, how would you go about designing that program? Uh, Where would be the key place you'd start? Well, everything starts because we're consumers. Livestock is a consumer, right? We are going to eat something, okay? So if I want a healthy human livestock, whether it's got feathers, whether it's got hair, I need to have something of nutrition, high dense nutrition going into that animal or human. For me to obtain that type of nutrition, I have to go back to my soil. And I have to have two things in place, my mineral balance and my microbial balance. Okay? And if I can worry about, I understand how to deal with those two factors. Again, the greatest thing about doing something right in the very first step is that it enhances step number two. It enhances step number three. It enhances step number four. I'm not creating for myself a series of hurdles or stumbling blocks down the road. So if I set my soil mineral balance correctly, I adjust my soil biology to the plants that I want to grow. And I get the diversity of biology in there, which we can do. Then those wonderfully pre-programmed little workers start to make that natural process occur. And I produce a way better plant which then is available for way better nutrient uptake and transfer. I have the biology, the rumen, or the gut, the GI system, or any organism that I want to be. And what I've created is a healthy, sustainable system. My microbes in my soil have to be balanced. My minerals have to be balanced. My plant nutrition has to be balanced and it's driven by nothing more than microbes and minerals. And my animals, Health and productivity is all based on what did I just put in there? What do I have to put in there? And so we have seen this happen over and over, is we can stop disease by changing the biology. We can improve feed conversion by digesting the feed long before it hits the gut. Not the 
I've got 24, 36 hours in an hour. What if I start that breakdown process with movement pathobiology? They're good guys, but if I employ that microorganism course to help make those nutrients available and build up months and months and months with vitamins, probiotics, and enzymes, and growth regulators. So when my cow eats this, what is what would normally become manure now transfers over to gain weight, produce milk, or meat, or eggs. And I now have created a whole store of nutritional supplements by a biology. Keep restricted. How many of you guys have been to a health store that can buy supplements? Man, they're expensive. Well, my coach will do it for free if you have the right kind of That's what they're designed to do. If you if you do have, you know, consider you have a good cropping program that's balanced, you feel like you're getting good, you know, good quality feedstock. In those situations, does feeding probiotics still pay? Oh, absolutely. Because especially in your ruins. These animals are not efficient digesters. They're at the bottom of the food chain when it comes to digestion. Right? 10, maybe 15% digestion uptake, feed conversion is great. Right? So why? Why isn't my feed conversion that good? Well, you're not absorbing most of what you're putting in. It's true. That's all feed conversion is. Is, is what do I transfer into energy and gain from what I feed? Well, how do we change that equation? Well, I, I can't plug up the back door and shove it in the front door. Break it down more okay. so it's absorbable. Can we employ the same biology that's in the gut, outside the gut, give us a head start? Yeah, we can. Right? And in the process, if I break down the structure, I'm going to get more nutrients out of it. It's not that there's not nutrition there, because Jim just said, hey, I'm not going to bury that anymore. I'm going to go get it, and I'm going to put it back on my field, because there's still a lot of value in that. Okay. But there's not quite the value in the door as there is a ribeye. The consumers really aren't clamoring for grade B manure versus grade A ribeye to get out into. No. Okay. So, it's all about how we convert that which we grow. And again, we can't do this. The whole process is microbially driven. So, can we employ those organisms to really enhance this process? So, one of the things with beef or dairy is on the forages, if you could inoculate that and then put it into some kind of a, a bag or something where we can properly uh, ferment it. Ferment it. Break it down. The structure. The basic thing about these microbes, we can put something that's got a lot of cellulose and liquid in the bag, and we can come back months later as we pull it out. It's like overcooked spinach. Right? Everything comes apart, and you go, wow, this is soft. This is going to get absorbed. And the other thing is, is I talk to my mom, they go, yeah, but there's some of that pigweed out there in that field. And there's a little of this, and there's a little of that. I said, yep. They go, oh, those weeds. And I go, what's a weed to you? It's likely a pretty nutritious herb to your cow. Give them a choice when you can free range them in the pasture. They'll select our weeds as their medicinal products. So, What's this nasty weed doing in the first place besides giving us fits and making Monsanto rich? Is, is this weed is there to accumulate nutrients and redistribute them more evenly. Now, nature has a process of doing this that takes time. However, the cool part is, is when you look at the nutrient content, take a weed, and I'll bet you it has a higher nutrient content than your forage. So, do you think your cow really cares? 
he has a wonderful piece of pickled pigweed. The nutrient content is way higher than that than the forage. He'll eat it first. Okay? So, I talked to one of my farmers and I said, those weeds might be bothering you. Did they bother your cow? He said, I never thought of that. I said, well, why don't you just chop them all up with everything else? Let's ferment the daylights out of them. Let the microbes have their way with them for four, three or four months. Then let's see if your cows pick through and go, hey, Jim, Jimbo, come over here. You see this big weed in here? Get this out of here. They get half. It'll, it'll be consumed like you need the forage. Okay? Because the microbes have time to convert the structure, reduce the toxins, change the substance. Okay? Now, I'm not saying you should go out there and chop all these weeds. I was with a, a farmer the other day and he said, What am I going to do with that field? It's nothing but weeds. I said, Well, you have two choices. You can either turn it in as a green manure crop, or you can cut it and ferment it. He says, Those cows don't need it. And I said, You're the only one that doesn't like weeds. Don't talk for your cows. They'll eat it. They'll probably like it because it's fixing the soil. It's got high nutrient content. So no, I, I think I know the answer to this is an, is an add on to what you just said about. Identifying an ideal program. Would you, if you had a choice, obviously conventional GMO in your forages, you're going to go probably on the non GMO side, right? Every single plant, every single kind. I don't need something altered, right? You are not taking a step forward with the gene restructuring. Because that has never been a problem. Our problem is not that our plants are genetically deficient. The problem is that our plants are nutrient deficient. Because we don't handle the mineral spectrum well, we don't handle the biological spectrum. Okay. We go back right to the very, very basics. Okay. Our animals are not half sick and not, and not exhibiting symptoms because we have an adequacy of pharmaceuticals in our system. My animals are not sick because I have a deficiency of a pharmaceutical or an antibiotic. They're sick because they don't have mineral nutrition. They don't have microbial balance. So if I want to keep my advantage for the Titanic and rearrange the deck chairs up there, thinking that this boat ain't going down, that's a very, very inefficient way of spending money. If you want to fix the problem, let's deal with what causes the problem. And every disorder is a mineral or microbial balance on this planet. Everything else is a whitewashed job that somebody else is going to count. But, but our animals are technically way smarter than we are at determining what they want to eat, what they should eat. Given the choice, they'll go get what they need. When we lock them in a tent and say, guess what, all you get is McDonald's every day, yeah, you're going to get sick. Okay? And so this is the problem is, is how do we manage these inputs here? Because this is what alters the system. I would go with the best soil program I could get, the broadest spectrum of biology I could get, I would go with the best seed I could buy. The heaviest seed, the most conventional seed, and I wouldn't worry about producing the most biomass. What I would be worried about is finding the hybrid type that allows it to grow with the broad spectrum of nutrients. The reason we started hybriding plants was because our mineral nutrition input started shrinking. And our old heirloom plants says, you know what, we need a lot of minerals to grow. So let's go select those nutrient deficient suckers out there that can give biome less nutrient content. And as we started selecting those varieties and those types, that could do with less nutrient and still grow biomass, we headed off in that direction because we've always been taught more is better. 
I mean, we're not paid on quality in commodity agriculture systems yet, are we? We're paid on mass. We're paid on volumes. But when you put enough empty volume in the system, it eventually has to collapse. And the fact that we've got the level of antibiotic use, the level of death loss, and mortality in our animals and in our human populations, it means that something is really drastically missing out of the substance and the quality of our food stocks. It doesn't matter if the cow's eating it or we're eating it. It's going to alter the biology, it's going to alter the health benefits, and we then go to the pharmaceutical for a good fix. And it really, again, is an imbalanced system. So I would go with the best plants I could buy, and I would employ biology every bit along the way. We've had farmers. My wife does uh, water kefir and milk kefir. She makes kombucha and all these cool things by microorganisms. And the farmers go, you look weird. Weird. Yeah, you want to ask me how weird I am? Stick around for about three days. I'll really show you weird. But they start trying some of this stuff and they go, I haven't been sick since I started drinking milk. Go, hmm. So I haven't had a stomachache. I haven't had diarrhea. I had one of the farmers. Come back and he says, what do you think about taking this culture I gave my pigs? I said, well, I don't know if I'd do that. He said, well, why it's food grade? And I said, yeah, it starts out as food grade, but we don't grow it in a food grade lab. He wanted to take it for himself? Yeah. Okay. And then he says, too late. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> I didn't write that prescription down, but he said, I stuck my finger in there, and I licked it a couple of times. And he said, I haven't had a gut ache or diarrhea since. And I go, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but these microbes change things in a big way, and they know what to do. You just have to get them in the right place and not kill them. Believe me, they do a marvelous job. They are so intelligently designed that they are the most incredible workforces out there. And if we, the better we learn to use them, the cooler things start to happen. And we've seen some really fun things happen with everything from chickens to lambs to cattle. They'll change, they'll change the equation, they'll alter the environment, so it's a good thing. But biology is that factor that makes the biggest difference in what we do. Our, our soil minerals aren't going to be the plant nutrition without the biology. Our plants that we grow are not going to be the nutritional content that we need without the biology. And then, when we finally get through with all this wonderful stuff, we have and why don't we take a 10 minute break and stretch and then we'll come back. Okay. Um, we, uh, the reason why it's a little cooler in here, I hope you're not uncomfortable today, but if we can turn the heat up. About three weeks ago when we had some major storms go through, we, one day we had a double, a three, a three power surge. Down and up, down and up, down and up, and it took out our big air conditioner. So this is an air conditioner that's pretty massive downstairs. And uh, so then we had to go through the insurance side of things and order one that's going to take five weeks to get it in. So 